Hello, everyone. Our meeting will start in two minutes. Okay. And Dr. Chu will join us uh, in a few minutes. Hi, it's 7 p.m. here in China, so we're going to start our webinar today. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to CCMA webinar on thyroid ablation Zoom meeting room. I'm Dana from Echo Microwave, and on behalf of CCMA and Echo Microwave, I'd like to welcome and thank everyone who joined us today. Um, before we get to the main topic, uh, I'm inviting all the audience to subscribe to Echo Microwave LinkedIn account for future webinar information. And the audience can send questions to the Zoom chat box and they will be discussed at the end of all the presentations. And if you need part participation certificate, uh, don't forget to email us to the info address as usual. So now uh, please allow me to introduce uh, our moderator today, uh, Dr. Samraj. Sam Thorawat is an assistant professor, international radiologist at Suraj Hospital, Mahido University, and scientific chair of Thai Society of Vascular and Intervention Radiology. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Samraj. Thank you. So um, good evening, everyone. So now it's 6 p.m. in Thailand. And so welcome all of you to joining the thyroid ablation webinar today. So first of all, I would like to thank the ECO to create a wonderful small webinar and focusing in thyroid ablation. So which one of the topic that we are very interested in. So especially in, in, in Asia population. So I think we, we know the thyroid ablation for many, many years. And this is a very well established for some country. But for our region, especially for the Southeast Asia, my country, Thailand, um, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Vietnam. So I think we are still in the uh, beginning phase of the, doing the thyroid ablation. So I hope this meeting will give us the, the idea how to start and where should we stand for the thyroid ablation. So today we have the four different speakers for, from four country. So I, I would take this opportunity to start the first topic. Okay. So let me introduce the first speaker of today. So he is a, one of my friends when he was a fellow in the ASAN and when I was there as well. And he was a, he is one of the, my good friends. So he's working as the, the radiologist in the 
Shunshan Medical University Hospital in the Taishung, Taiwan. And he, I, I believe he is one of the pioneer to introduce the thyroid ablation in the Taiwan population. He not only doing the academic job and he also sharing the knowledge to the Taiwanese population in the social medias. If we are follow him to the Facebook and we will see. So his topic today is a thermal ablation of the thyroid nodule in the RFA perspective. So Dr. Shen, please. Yeah, thank you. So let me share my PowerPoint. Thank you for the bank, I think. We are a startup bank introduced. We are good friends because we both of us were the roommates when we start, when we stay in Seoul. So now today I'm going to talk about some operation for thyroid. I majorly will focus on IFA because as sorry, because as we all know for thyroid nodule, in addition to surgery nowadays, we have many different minimal invasive treatment for most of then I think I for now is very mature in Taiwan because uh, I was in Asa Medical Center in the year of 2015, about six years ago. After I come back from Seoul, we promote this procedure in Taiwan. And I think now in Taiwan, I for is widely accepted for all people and the doctors. And we also have Haifu, but Haifu is just getting popular, not the common. But fortunately, uh, because of echo company, now we also have the microwave. Because this year, I just have my very preliminary experience to use microwave to treat thyroid nodule. In the end of my presentation, I will shortly to introduce my very preliminary experience about microwave. But I majorly still focus on thyroid IFA. I think most of us are familiar with this kind of thyroid IFA, so maybe I will and focus on some case sharing. And I think all of the doctor don't like complications. So we'll talk about the complication, how to deal with the complication and what kinds of complication we will encounter during the IFA procedure. So let's begin with the case sharing. Because the I think we have to know the, the indication of the IFA, no matter how IFA or high food or a microwave, we think, I think all of us will agree with to treat the benign symptomatic thyroid nodules because for this kind of patient, I think surgery is very efficient. If it's very effective to treat this kind of patient, but usually I think it's too aggressive for the patient with benign symptomatic thyroid nodules. So this kind of thermal operation is very good for this kind of people. But now some kind of have also mentioned the recurrent thyroid cancer because for this kind of patient, maybe sometimes they have received neck dissection and uh, they still encounter the, rec the recurrent or metastasic lesion. And the most of the lesion are very small if they receive surgery again, maybe it's very difficult for a surgeon and uh, also the patient will uh, suffer from many complications. So in some guidelines, they also mentioned for this kind of recurrent thyroid cancer, if they refuse to receive or they cannot tolerate the surgery, maybe IFA or microwave is very good for this kind of patient. But recently for this kind of topic, popular microcarcinoma, some guidelines they just mentioned, but they don't have many suggestions. So in this issue, I think in the future, maybe PTMC is also kind of indication for the thermal operation, but now most of the kind I just mentioned benign symptomatical thyroid nodule and the recurrent thyroid cancer. So let's begin with some benign symptomatic uh, nodules. For this kind of situation, most of the thyroid nodule will cause cosmetic problem. We can see here, the patient have very obvious mass lesion here and the after operation, we can see it's obvious decrease the thyroid nodule. I think it's the same patient. You can see the nemus was here, but we can see the ultrasound experience. Before operation, you can see it's a very large thyroid nodule. I saw a coic and uh, have some cystic portion. After performing several times IFA, you can see just very small nodule. I think oh, I totally operate this nodule. It's just the residual thyroid nodule. And for this nodule, it's not very big, but here is the esophagus. The patient complain kind of esophagia, compressive symptoms. So I initially I uh, 
recommend her just follow up but the patient think the dysphagia may be due to this nodule so I perform IFA for her. One month later the result seems not very good but six months later about one year, you can see very small the esophagus was here. So for this kind of patient, if they receive surgery, it's not very difficult for a surgeon because now the surgery for this kind of nodule is very easy for the doctor, but the patient have to receive the lobotomy. Sometimes in very rare situation, even they just receive single lobotomy, they still have to encounter hypothyroidism. It's very it's difficult situation for a patient, but if we just perform IFA for them, it's very easy for us and we can also help them solve their problem. Another patient, you can see the nodule is not very, not very big, but it's just above the trachea and the, the patient have very also very obvious uh, cosmetic problem. So the patient did not like this situation, just request me to perform IFA and the one month later, three months later, and the even one year later, you can see it's very, very small. So for this kind of Benign symptomatic nodule, I think all of us can accept that thermal operation, including IFA or microwave, is really very effective for this kind of patient. And uh, we just use local anesthesia. The, it's just an OPD procedure. Usually for my patient, they just come to my outpatient clinics in the morning and uh, I will finish my procedure before 12 o'clock. So they still can have their lunch. It's very easy for us. And uh, it's kind of um, different situation. You can see the scar here. You know, the patient have the popular thyroid cancer with lymph node metastasis. So he received total net dissection, uh, total thyroidectomy, and the retro net dissection. You can see the scar was here. So we can see the uh, serious thyroglobulin change before operation, and then he received operation. After that, we can see for the Biochemical complete response, usually after surgery and after radioiodine treatment, the serogobulin level should be less than 0 .0 0 0.2, but you can see the serogobulin is not very good. We still can see the serogobulin level was above two. It means there might be some small metastasis lymph node or some residual or recurrent lymph node. So I performed washout TG for this patient and they found two small recurrent lymph node. But the patient have already received detonate net dissection. The patient did not want to receive surgery again. So I performed IFA for him. So you can see I performed IFA for him. After that, you can see the serogobumin was less than 0 0.2. It means we can help the patient to have structure and the biochemical complete response. I, uh, for some surgeons, I think we still perform surgery for this kind of situation. But for patients, they really don't want to receive surgery again because it's really very uh, suffer experience for them. And we can see another case is this is another recurrent uh, lymph node just later to the internal jugular band. You can see it's very close to the internal jugular band. It looks very scary, but if you are good at the thermal operation technique, it's, we still can treat it it's very well. You can see after six months far up, it's almost complete disappearance. Even it's very close to the internal jugular band, even close to CCA, I think it did not cause any problem to us. Sometimes we have to use hydrodissection or use very small electrode to treat this kind of to treat this kind of situation. But usually the patient still can tolerate the whole procedure. And then we can see this different situation. It's also a recurrent lymph node, but you can see it's the size is about uh, one centimeter. But here you can see, I think this nodule is the, this nodule invade the trachea. You can see here in this situation we still can do. You can see that after that. The node, the recurrent region was obvious decrease. So even the node invade the, the recurrent region invade the trachea. If we can perform, or we can perform IFA very carefully, we still can treat them. I think we, I totally treat this region, and this is just some scar-like tissue. So in this situation, for benign symptomatic node and the recurrent lymph node, it's now, if your technique is mature, it does not cause any problem for us. 
And then this is another case you can see here. This is PTMC, and then we perform hydrodissection here. Because usually we recommend use transismous approach, but for this nodule, I think the angle was too acute for me. So I give up uh, trans, transismous approach. I use lateral to medial approach. But in this situation, you we have to be very careful because recurrent angular nerve is here. So if we don't perform hydrodissection, it's not easy for us to complete treat this region. So I perform hydrodissection. Here you can see I inject 5% glucose water and we can separate the thyroid and the, the trachea. And now we perform IFA for the patient. And you can see I totally upgrade the whole nodule. The size was bigger than the original size because we recommend to upgrade the peripheral normal brain camera to make sure we already upgrade the whole region. And we can see here before and after maybe I forgot maybe six months follow up is almost total disappearance. So for this kind of PTMC, if the patient do not want to receive or they could not tolerate the operation, I think IFA or microwave is still very effective for them to treat the primary thyroid cancer. And this is another issue you can see. This is a primary a parathyroid adenoma. For this kind of primary parathyroid adenoma, in the past, uh, the patient usually received surgery. But now, because I think our technique is mature enough so we can handle this kind of situation. You can see before treatment, after treatment, it's become very small. And uh, we can see the IPTH label before treatment, after treatment, and uh, we, I follow up for Far up for several months, the IPTH was still within the normal limit. So for the case sharing, I just share some very, I think the case was not very difficult because I'm not sure the audience, if all of the audience are good at Sarah IFA or microwave. So I just share some common case for all of us. As our moderators say in Thailand, they want to promote this procedure. I think if you are good enough, it's won't cause any difficulty, but you still have some learning curve. So now we talk about the communication, I think, not that <laughs> like communication, but it's really very suffer for all of us. For this communication, we have to know how about the percentage uh, our patient will encounter a uh, communication. It's really very bad situation for us, but we have to let our patient know the percentage, uh, how often, we are the communication we are happen. It's usually according to this meta analysis for P9 audio, the communication rate was about 2.4%. But for recurrent, because recurrent cancer usually cross to vagus nerve, uh, usually cross to some nerve structure or cross to some vessel structure. So for recurrent region, the communication rate is much higher than P9 cytoin audio. So I usually recommend doctor in Taiwan, if they want to perform IFA, maybe they just perform first in the benign audio. If they want to challenge themselves, they can try recurrent thyroid cancer because according to very literature, they have mentioned that the communication to treat recurrent lesion is much higher than benign thyroid audio. But if you are good at this procedure, the communication will be lower as 1%. It depends on how skillful we are to use the electro to treat our patients. So we, at least we have to know the, how often will the communication will happen for the patient. So what kinds of communication we, we encounter during the whole procedure? According to radiology in 2012, there are kinds of communication, but you don't, we don't have to worry because most of the communication will be reversible. Well, I think for the most the most terrible complication will be voice change. In, I usually give lecture in Taiwan, so I usually like to show how the patient suffer from voice change during the IFA. Before the communication happened, the patient still can talk to you. Once the communication happened, the patient will immediately say, Doctor, what's wrong with my voice? Just like this situation. The person will lose their voice just in front of us. It's really very scary for all of us, but we still can deal with this kind of situation. Later, I will share one of my 
very terrible situation, but I still can help the patient to recover their voice. But I hope all of us never see or never encounter this situation. So you can see this is my patient before operation and I perform the IFA very smoothly and then the patient come back. And then when the patient come back to my operation clinic about one month, the patient mentioned if she think the neck was swelling and the, 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 mark, the neck mass seems enlarged. You can see here, I perform ultrasound for her. You can see here is the fluid and I put the carotoprite. Here we can see some uh, carotoprite here in English. It's my first case to, it's my first case to, uh, my first this kind of complication case. Initially, I think maybe I have pseudoaneurysm. In some situation, the literature have told us pseudoaneurysm is one of the possible complication of RFA because I see here, maybe I, in my mind, I think, oh my God, I encounter pseudoaneurysm. So I perform, I request CT for her. You can see, oh, it's not pseudoaneurysm. It's not your lecture. It's really a nightmare for the doctor who performed IFA. So what should we do? I just perform, I just request her to follow up one month, two months, three months, and then it's total absorption by herself. You can see here, it's the end of the follow up, but before treatment, you can see. So even a patient, even we encounter nodiology, we don't have to worry, but it takes time for patient to recover from this situation. Maybe we can prescribe some medication, for example, some steroid, because in some literature have mentioned that for this kind of nodular rupture, maybe due to maybe due to some information, information situation. So some literature recommend us prescribe some steroid, low dose steroid. But if we, you don't prescribe any medicine, it's okay. But the patient will suffer from neck swelling. And uh, you can see it's, it's another rupture case. This year I encountered this situation, <laughs> but the patient totally recovered now. You can see here the skin will become, it is better change in some past like situation. And the follow up, you can see here, it's recovered and the, at the end. It's her previous OP scar. So you can see the skin will have obvious change, but you don't have to worry. Usually the patient can totally recover. But for this patient, it takes four months to have this result. So it's very suffering for us, but you don't have to worry. I usually tell Taiwan doctor, if you really encounter this situation, don't worry, just contact me, I can help you. And you can see here, I also perform MI for her. You can see here, rupture in this situation, very terrible situation. But at the end, same situation, we have see similar situation. The, this rupture material will just uh, absorption by, our, by the patient, so we don't have to worry. But we have to very cautiously not to cause infection. So sometimes I will also prescribe some antibiotics for this kind of patient. And then this is another nightmare, more exchange uh, during IFA. You can see here, this is vocal cord, just fixation. But after some treatment, you can see the vocal cord recover before the patient leave my procedure room. But it's really very suffer. You can see here, this vocal cord can move, but this vocal cord is fixed. It means the patient knows her voice during my eye way. It's another nightmare for the doctor. We can see, what do I do during, uh, what do I do to help her recover from her voice change? You can see, is the thyroid bay, thyroid bay, thyroid bay. I inject cold dextrose water and after that the patient recover from the voice change. Actually the professor back, my teacher, has already published a paper to use the, uh, how to management the numb damage during IFA. You can see if you inject the cold dextrose water, you can see those who receive dextrose water injection usually can recover this kind of symptom 
immediately or during the injection of that source water. But if you really encounter this situation, I think most of us will be very nervous because the patient usually receive IFA or summary and some more operation, just local anesthesia. So the patient will also be very nervous in this situation. We have to be stay calm, don't, don't be nervous. So I just uh, briefly uh, introduced my first case of microwave experience because this year in Taiwan, we just have microwave. I really happy eco company can introduce their uh, products to Taiwan. So I, I, I choose a 17 gauge to 3.5 millimeter uh, needle and the they recommend 30 watts. It's before and after one month follow, I think it's diffuse hypoid coil change. Personally, I think my coil is really very powerful because I, I, the position time is much shorter than IFA and the, the patient did not have much complaint. If, because in my mind, initially, I think maybe I, my coil is too powerful for patient. Maybe patient will complain pain or any discomfort during the procedure. But during, but during my first microwave procedure, I think it's quite okay or quite comfortable for my patient. So just uh, let me make a short conclusion. I think some operation for siren audio is very efficient, e e effective, no matter for uh, benign, siren, benign symptomatic audio or recurrent PDMC or parasiren audio. And the communication usually will be temporary. We have to know how to manage this kind of situation. And uh, for microwave, I think it's really powerful and it's very good for bigger nodule. So I think in the future, I still uh, will choose some bigger nodule and uh, I will use microwave to treat this kind of patient. I hope my show presentation will help all of us know something about some operation for thyroid. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Shen, to give us uh, various kind of the treatment of the IFA and also the microwave into the thyroid operation in your daily practice. So uh, in this meeting, we will we we already have sparing the time for the Q and A session and the case discussion after of the four topic of the lecture. So you can uh, give us for the question into the chat box, and I will ask. Uh, the all speaker for you after the whole session will end. So the next topic, so we have to rearrange some schedule because we have some technical problems. So we will change into the topic of Dr. Giovanni. So he cannot come into our live session in the web, this webinar. So, but he already have the pre-recorded video. So his topic is very interesting because it's about the guideline. So they, he will provide us the thyroid ablation, the guideline of the treatment, including the benign and the malignancy. So he is an interventional radiologist in the Milan and they specialize for the many kinds of the tumor ablation. So please enjoy the lecture. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share Dr. Giovanni's uh, pre-recording. Um, can you see it? Yes. Perfect. Colleagues, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, the beginning for having me for this very interesting uh, webinar. It's a great honor to be here uh, to talk to you about uh, the guidelines that uh, nowadays we have for thermal ablation in both benign and malignant thyroid uh, nodules. Uh, I am Dr. Maui, I'm working in Milan at the European Institute of Oncology, working performing thermal ablation in different clinical scenarios from uh, renal to liver to lung ablations, and also I'm dedicated to the treatment of thyroid uh, diseases. So as a background, we have to acknowledge that probably still at uh, the present, there are too many thyroidectomies that are still performed uh, in several countries for benign thyroid not. I will talk to you initially on benign condition and then on the malignant one. If you see from this table, still a very large number 
of uh, patients every year undergo surgery for thyroid uh, diseases and the uh, different rate going from 30 percent in italy to close to 60 percent in france are treated for benign conditions so the numbers where we can uh, start to have an impact are very very large because uh, if not if not all as for sure, a majority of those cases can be managed in a more conservative way than surgery. Better understand the aspect of minimally invasive uh, techniques in uh, thyroid nodular disease. In 2019, the European Thyroid Association had a survey among their uh, participants. So a survey was sent to all the members through Europe to understand uh, how they approach uh, uh, minimal invasive treatments of the thyroid. And in this survey, uh, some different scenarios were presented. For example, it was asked, it was presented the case of a 50 years old female with a four centimeter spongiform nodules, Eutarex tube with a benign final aspiration with symptoms of compression. And following an identical case, but in a patient of 75 year old with severe comorbidities like diabetes, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, and renal failure. How did the participant uh, answer? In the first case, 60% requested uh, surgery, and only 70% suggested uh, radiofrequency and 8% laser means a thermal ablation. While the scenario completely changed in the case of older patients, for example, for the case of the 75 years old male, where uh, the majority, but still only one third of the participants recommended the thermal, uh, thermal ablation. So there is some idea that this kind of procedure can be offered, but still particularly in very complex uh, patients when surgery is not, is not feasible. Also, again, other two uh, scenarios of a patient with malignant thyroid disease, again, 75 year old female or 25 years old female uh, with uh, thyroidectomy and lateral and central compartment neck dissection and afterward local non radioiodine iodine lymph node metastasis. You see in the old case of the 75 years old female, uh, still, uh, 55% uh, of participants requested surgery as first treatment option, while in the case of the young one, surgery uh, was requested in the lower uh, number of patients and ablation uh, had a higher percentage of, of responders. So again, quite a variable, um, variable uh, scenarios. But particularly, uh, one point that came to the attention was that uh, in uh, close to 70% of cases, the responders never or rarely refer patient to center with specific expertise in thermal ablation. But if they do not have uh, in their hospital this kind of expertise, they do not suggest the thermal ablation. And this is quite strange from one side, but uh, uh, determined us to try to understand a little bit better why uh, so many endocrinologists uh, did not consider thermal ablation. And the reason why physician never or rarely refer patient to ultrasound guided procedure, minimally invasive uh, treatments, was in the majority of cases because there were no endocrine society guideline on the use of minimally invasive treatments. So in some way, uh, endocrinologists were scared about uh, referring a patient to a procedure that was not included into a guideline. That's why uh, in the 2020, the European Thyroid Association published the first clinical practice guideline to use of thermal ablation in benign thyroid nodules. And also 
uh, this year, we, together also with the Cardiovascular Interventional Society of Europe, uh, performed an analysis and published the clinical practice guideline for the use of minimally invasive treatments in malignant thyroid lesions. So at the present, we have two guidelines, one for benign and one for malignant. So this should be the basis for enlarging the application of minimally invasive treatments uh, in uh, patients with thyroid nodules. However, we should acknowledge that guidelines are not enough and sometimes uh, might not be only an angel, but may determine relevant problems for physicians that can feel compelled to decide for some uh, procedure instead of others. So uh, the main purposes of clinical guidelines are to describe the appropriate care based on the best available scientific evidence and uh, a broad consensus, trying to reduce the inappropriate variation in the clinical practice for a more rational basis for referral, focus of, for continued education to promote efficient use of the resources, which are also uh, always limited, to act as a focus for quality control including audit and twilight shortcomings of existing literature and suggest appropriate future research. However, from it is known that from the publication of guidelines, there's always uh, some barriers to their implementation in the clinical activity because there are general resistances to changes. It, they are seen sometimes as a loss of professional autonomy and uh, sometimes there's also an enterprise skill set and lack of decision to support technology. Often they are out of date because when they are published are based on old literature and the current practice is changing while the guidelines are published. Also, we should always remember that the value judgment made by a guideline development group might be the wrong choice for individual patients. So again, always remember that guidelines provide us with a guide, but not with a strict indication on what really we should do. It's something that we have to take into consideration. So let's start from the guidelines on benign thyroid nodules published in 2020 by this group of authors. As a background, we should just briefly remember that there are uh, papers like this meta-analysis that I coordinated and we published in 2020, showing how uh, thermal ablation are able to provide uh, uh, long-lasting results, both radiofrequency and laser, with sustained results over at least three years. So we have a robust meta-analysis uh, that provide us good results. And also another paper of the Italian multidisciplinary group for the study of minimally invasive treatments uh, published by my colleague, Dr. Bernardi, which I had the pleasure to coordinate and showing how the results are uh, sustained at five years with very good results, but highlighting how in some cases there might be a regrowth of the nodule. So this is something that we should always take into consideration when uh, thinking about proposing this kind of treatment to our patient, because we have to take care of the idea that one third of cases sometimes might recover, might have a regrowth of the, of the nodule. A systematic literature review was performed, and in both guidelines, a grading of quality of evidence was performed, going from very low to low to moderate or high, and a level of recommendation was divided into two levels, strong or weak. So in all the recommendation, you will see a grade of evidence and a level of recommendation. The first recommendation state that in older patients with benign thyroid nodules that cause pressure symptoms, remember, you have to treat symptomatic nodules or cosmetic concerns and decline surgery, image guided thermal ablation or minimally invasive treatment should be considered as a cost and effective 
alternative option to surgical treatment or observation. So still in this guideline, it is suggested that the patient should be not candidate surgery or decline surgery. I would just like to point out that in our national guidelines, we uh, instead stated that thermal ablation may be proposed as a first line treatment for solid non-functioning current nodules. So actually we are moving a little bit from the option to apply this treatment only in patient not suitable for surgery to uh, a real alternative to surgery offering this treatment as a first line treatment. I'm not going to read you all the recommendations that you can easily find in the paper, but I just would like to show you the one that I think are most interesting also for a potential later debate. So the third recommendation, remember that before relation of a thyroid lesion, a benign cytological diagnosis is needed. It is suggested to repeat an FNA for cytological benign nodules uh, with the exception of spongiform nodules and purely cystic nodules. So nodules with uh, very clear ultrasound features of benignity. Also, it, there's a strong recommendation against performing minimally invasive treatment for those nodules that present with high risk ultrasound features. So if you have a suspect on ultrasound, even in pre the presence of a benign FNA, do not perform thermal ablation. The sixth recommendation states that local subcutaneous and pericapsular anesthesia is recommended. It is possible also not to perform local anesthesia, for example, when performing laser, but still it is uh, recommended. Conscious sedation can be used, it can be considered, so it is the choice of the operator. It's not uh, obligatory to do mild conscious sedation, but can be, can be used. Coming to the eight uh, is about uh, the suggestion for uh, the uh, evaluation after treatment. So an early term in uh, two to three months, mid term six and 12 months, and then every one to two years ultrasound evaluation is recommended. At 12 recommendation, state that in multinodal goiter, due to the present lack of evidence of efficacy and particularly for the need of repeated treatment that can occur in a not negligible number of cases, thermal ablation should be restricted to those patients with a very well-defined dominant nodule in the setting of the multinodal goiter, or those who are not candidate for thyroid surgery or radioactive treatment as a palliative therapy option. So at the moment, multinodal ergoiter is still not uh, our ideal field of application. Another recommendation, 13 recommendation, state that because of a higher cost and complexity as compared with aspiration and ethanol ablation, at the present thermal ablation are not recommended as first line treatment for pure or predominantly cystic thyroid lesions. Again, strong recommendation. It means that in the presence of cystic lesion, still ethanol ablation is the first option of treatment because it is cheaper and easier to be performed. Also, uh, thermal ablation should be considered in a young patient with small autonomously functioning thyroid nodule and particularly in those cases with small nodules and incomplete suppression of the perinodular thyroid tissue due to the higher probability of normalization of the thyroid function and the advantage of avoiding irradiation and restricting the risk of late hypothyroidism. These were the recommendations for benign nodule. Let's see a clinical case of a patient with a malignant one is a female with six millimeter hypoechoic irregular nodule. Here you can see the images where once detected, we decide to perform FNA. There should be debated if with such a small nodule, FNA sh should have been performed, but we found a small papillary thyroid cancer. 
And so once we have detected a small papillary thyroid cancer, we really would want to propose our patient not to do nothing, or we want to move the patient directly to surgery, or why not to propose image guided ablation? Once we have overdiagnosed a very small uh, nodule, we have seen this with ultrasound perform FNA, found a cancer. Why we cannot try to minimize the invasiveness of treatment? That's what we do. And in our patient, we propose at our institution always the three options. We recently published our preliminary results with quite a small series of patients. But what I would like to point out is that all the patients that were feasible, in which ablation was feasible, agreed and were very happy of having this option. Coming through the guideline, we stated as the first recommendation that it is necessary to take into consideration the use of minimally invasive treatments in the multimodal approach to patients with thyroid cancer. So when you deal with a patient with thyroid cancer, a multidisciplinary discussion should take place and image guided ablation should be among the panel of available options. How to balance between uh, minimally invasive treatments or surgery in the paper are also reported some factors favoring surgery or favoring thermal ablation. For example, the age, the familiar history of aggressive form of thyroid cancer, then the refusal of surgery, and also the presence of expertise of both thyroid surgery and uh, ultrasound guided procedures. Then a multidisciplinary team, including members with specific expertise in minimally invasive treatments, should perform the selection of patients eligible for minimally invasive treatment based on the patient's clinical, demographic, and imaging characteristics. Regarding the modality to be chosen for minimally invasive treatment, this should be selected on the basis of the staging of disease, patient characteristics and preferences, and also specific competencies and resources at the treating centers. So there is not a clear rule for using microwaves, for using radio frequency or laser, but it really depends on the case by case on patient characteristics, but also by the experience of the operator and the availability of the material. It means that if you are very good in microwave ablation, go with microwave ablation for thyroid nodule. But also it is strongly recommended always to inform the patient about the feasibility of minimally invasive treatment, its advantages and limitations in comparison with other strategies. This means that when you face this kind of patient, you cannot anymore do not tell them anything about this option. Patients should be informed about the presence of minimally invasive treatments. That can be also considered for palliative purposes but only for palliative purposes in a tech context of a multidisciplinary approach in patients with other kind of primary thyroid cancer other than low risk PTNC. And here the strength of recommendation is lower. This is really only for palliative purposes. What about the recurrences? We know that recurrences might occur in the not negligible number of cases and might be highly disabling for, for patients where second surgery might be extremely challenging for the possible side effects and should be always carefully weighted against the risk of treatment failure. Also, most recurrences are not clearly aggressive and patient is worried and sometimes prefer but the patient prefer clearance of the disease. So again, might we have any kind of role in lowering the invasiveness of treatment by providing an effective cure for patients? 
And here we say that to consider minimally invasive treatment as an alternative option to surgical neck dissection in patients with radioiodal refractory cervical recurrences who are at surgical risk or decline further surgery. So again, in these cases, this uh, is an option that should be taken into consideration, but only in cases not suitable or refusing surgery and that cannot be managed by radioiodine ablation. Here also, there are some factors that can be in favor of thermal ablation and other that can favor surgery. If you have an old patient with relevant comorbidities, previous neck dissection uh, with a feasible ablation, so with limited number of metastases and ideally small metastases, so, and you have an easy percutaneous access, so, ablation can be the ideal option for this patient. In the other option, if you have a very young uh, patient with no comorbidities, acceptance of surgeries, multiple metastases, or larger one, and with a good long-term prognosis, so still surgery might be the ideal option for these, uh, for these patients. Just let me conclude showing you a case of a patient with a lymph node, a metastatic lymph node from uh, papillary thyroid cancer. You see a single uh, lesion, quite small, uh, quite easy to be reached in the percutaneous way. The patient was uh, already treated with two NERC dissections, so she really refused to have another surgery. We performed percutaneous uh, ablation. You see the gas forming during the treatment. We always perform CUS after the treatment to evaluate the presence of uptake or the complete the vascularization of the lesion. And here you can see the result where we have the pre-ablation PET CT scan and 12 months after the complete absence of uptake at that level. So a complete treatment with very, very minimally invasiveness. So coming to conclusion, we can state that in older patients with benign thyroid nodule that cause pressure symptoms, always remember that we are treating the symptoms of the patient, not the nodule. In these cases, thermal ablation should be considered as an alternative option to surgery. And now we have guidelines that state us that we should consider this. We are no more allowed not to tell the patient that this option exists. Even if this is not available in our hospital, we have to tell this to the patient and eventually to refer the patient to another center. Also, these procedures can be suggested in patients with autonomous functional nodule, particularly if they are small when the results are really better, and an incomplete suppression of the perinodular tissue uh, is present because in these cases there is an higher probability of thyroid function normalization and the absence of late hypothyroidism that can be conversely deriving from uh, a radioiodine ablation. The choice of surgery or thermal ablation should be the result of a careful balance between the nodal characteristics, general clinical conditions, available resources, and the patient's value and preferences. Regarding malignant diseases, consider the using of thermal ablation for patients with low risk papillary thyroid microcarcinoma, particularly if the patient is at surgical risk is expected to have a short life expenses or is unwilling to undergo surgery or active surveillance. Often patients do not really like active surveillance once we have diagnosed a cancer, but on the other hand, are scared about major surgery. Also, thermal ablation can be considered as an alternative to surgical neck dissection in those patients with radioiodine refractory recurrences, again, in cases at high surgical risk or in patients who decline further surgery. So we have nowadays two guidelines 
one for benign, one for malignant conditions that can guide our practice toward a larger application of thermal ablation in the patient with thyroid diseases. And so thanks to those two paper, I think and I hope that the number of procedures that we will be able to perform will increase significantly in the next years. And with this, I uh, would like to thank you for your attention, hoping to having provided you a clear enough uh, overview of the present uh, guidelines. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so it's thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, uh, the beginning wow. for having me for this very interesting uh, webinar. It's a great honor to be here uh, to talk to you about uh, the guidelines that uh, nowadays we have for thermal ablation in both benign and malignant thyroid and uh, novels. I, I, uh, I Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay, thank you. Also, okay, thank you, Dr. Giovanni, to give us the, the very detail in the guideline, not only the benign thyroid nodule and also the malignancy perspective. So don't forget to uh, leave your question into the chat box and we will have the Q&A sessions at the end of the, our lectures and we will have to answer the question at that time. So let move on into the next topic. So the next speaker is the assistant professor Chu Shaowei from the SGS Singapore General Hospital. So he is a, a very expert in the many IR procedure and for sure the ablation is a one of them. So he always give us the special technique and interesting idea for treating the IR procedure. So today he is gonna give us the idea of the thyroid ablation in the malignancy cases. So Dr. Chu, please. And thank you very much, Dr. Samrak. Hi, I'm Chao Wei. I'm from the Singapore General Hospital. And these are my disclosures for today. Now, um, we're going to divide, and so they have been a bit of overlap in the talks, but we are going to delve a little bit deeper. And these are the three categories uh, that we're going to talk about. So papillary thyroid microcastinoma. So this is PTC, there's dim as low risk, less than one centimeter. Differentiated thyroid carcinomas, so these are slightly larger PTCs, or follicular or medullary, and recurrent disease post-surgery. Now, I have to warn everybody there that while we have seen quite a bit of evidence the evidence for cancer is really not so clear cut and we will go through why. Now first, papillary thyroid microcarcinomas. Now, the treatment of papillary thyroid carcinomas is controversial on its own in surgery. And it's really because they have excellent prognosis, 97% tenure survival with surgery. I have professors telling me that, you know, you've got to choose one cancer to have in your lifetime, this is one of them. Now, the vast majority are incidentally discovered because, well, we are scanning more thyroids than ever before. Now, we do know that although we have picked up so much more PTMCs, there is no change of mortality. So are we over-treating these people? And hence, uh, active surveillance for low-risk tumors is a management thing. Now, the first of all, it starts with Ito et al. 2014, and this came from Japan from the Kuma Hospital, and this is how they define PTMC and what they want to do um, to, uh, 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 for active surveillance and what triggers uh, treatment. So the first paper used 3MM, as you can see, subsequent treatment started using greater than 50%. Now they found that PTMC in young patients less than 40 years old may progress faster than in older patients. Now, now this is definitely uh, quite easy to think about. Young patients have a longer runway. Maybe they should get uh, surgery or more definitive treatment because they have longer to live. Subsequently, the subsequent papers, most of them use volume increase by 50% as size enlargement. And you can see that most of them think that it follows predictable kinetics. Once again, for O et al, in 2018, the risk of increased volume in size is the highest in under 45 years old. So if you are going to offer active surveillance, maybe in the older population. 
Now, the advantages and disadvantages of offering active surveillance is really as follows. So nobody wants extra surgery that they don't need or outcomes. Whereas the disadvantages, as some of the other um, um, speakers have said, is a long follow-up time. You need uh, ultrasounds yearly and patient anxiety, as well as you know cooperation on both the patient and the doctor side. And we may miss aggressive histologies on FNAC. Now, the issues here with active surveillance is when should we act? Kuma Hospital uh, shows us the tumor size one in three mm. Subsequent authors says increase in fifty percent. Now, cervical lymph node certainly needs to be evaluated. If there's no abnormal cervical lymph nodes, you are okay for active surveillance. But what we do know for those of us who practice diagnostic ultrasound, the central lymph nodes are notoriously difficult to assess on ultrasound. And this is what we're missing in a lot of times. So we do know for PTMCs, for those that go operation for are operated while the ultrasound is clear, sometimes we do get one or two positive central cervical lymph nodes. And of course, cost effectiveness. Is it truly cost effective to follow up patients? So this is one of the um, example, uh, probably one of the uh, largest studies so far for ultrasound guided ablation for low risk PTMCs. Follow up uh, quite uh, not too bad, uh, no, across about 10 years, size more than one centimeter, all pathological defined with no evidence of extra thyroid extension or metastases who uh, had medical contraindication or refused surgery. These are good lesions to do with some hydrodissection of the trachea and we can ablate them. Now, complication rate is quite low, overall 3.06%, major only 0.8%, no life, none of them are life threatening, certainly no decreased thyroid function, local tumor recurrence, cervical lymph node metastasis, nothing, no additional uh, uh, surgery because of pancreatic cancer. So this is quite good result as compared with this other chart, how far we have come. All reports quite good results. The basic question is, is the follow-up period long enough? Is five to 10 years long enough for PTMCs for such great survival uh, for cancers? And this is something I think that does have not settled. Now, Professor Giovanni has gone through this and we will then not go through too much of this. So again, is favoring uh, ablation when they can't get surgery, they don't want to get surgery, then you, we can offer favoring surgery for young patients you know, who are worried, et cetera. And of course, technical expertise. We now move on to differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Now in the uh, Cersei ETA guidelines, we should only consider these preferentially in the context of a multimodality approach in patients with primary thyroid cancer other than low risk PTMCs. And this uh, paper out of China is probably one of the landmark papers. Safety and efficacy for terminal ablation for solitary T1. Now T1 for PTC is under two centimeters. So T1A is under one centimeter, T1B is under two centimeter. Both groups have very good survival outcomes as you can see here. But certainly when you get larger in the T1B group, you're going to run into more complication rate. And this is something that we need to recognize. The thyroid is a very small organ. And once you start to do a two centimeter lesion and you want margins, and this is where we start running into problems. Certainly not something that you want to try on your first go. Now, the, the other thing about follicular neoplasm um, that I think is understated. So again, a follicular neoplasm is very hard to diagnose on fine needle aspiration. It can be a follicular adenoma, hyperplasia, carcinoma, and Herten cell neoplasm. It's really because the pathologists need things like capsular, vascular, or extra thyroid tissue invasion. Core biopsy in this arena is still remain controversial. Certainly, my own pathologist has called me up sometimes. They say, why are you doing a core biopsy? I say, I need to RFA the patient. I'm so sorry. Now, small series have supported the use of ablation follicular carcinomas below two centimeters, but this remains controversial. So if you're going to offer ablation for follicular neoplasms, you need to tell your patient. My personal tip is they must look benign on ultrasound, get informed consent, and get a longer follow-up for these patients. Now, recurrent thyroid carcinoma, this has been covered as well, and these are the two reasons why. Now, personally, on the MDTs, I get referred patients post neck dissection and post uh, radio iodine. Once they have post uh, both of them, I'm happy to offer really because there's nothing much going on. Safety and efficacy wise, when we compare radio frequency as well as ethanol ablation, now both are 
acceptable mortalities with acceptable efficacy as well as uh, uh, complications. But again, we do not have long-term survival data or comparative data for in this arena. And this is something we must remember. Although we are offering treatments and we are in a way cherry picking all these tumors out, we really do not have data yet on long-term survival. Now, this is um, really uh, one of the first cases that we have done, you know, as usual, when we first start out, people refer you cases that you know, nobody wants to do. 47-year-old Chinese female, primarily a uh, primary pulmonary hypertension, so cannot undergo GA. And she presents with two very angry looking uh, uh, PTCs on the left and right side. And it's really no fun. And, but because we, she really has no other option, we decided to go ahead and ablate. In 2014, we ablated each side of them. Both nodules get smaller until 2016, whereby the treated right-sided nodule got bigger with a new nodule. Uh, although the left side was very quiet, I went to re-ablate the nodule in 2016. 2017 still have flow. And this is something, so as Dr. Giovanni has said, well, you can do a contrast-enhanced ultrasound. Sometimes with very high-end linear probes, you can pick up very small vascularity. We go ahead and repeat ablation. Finally, in 2019, after three ablations and about four years, we have no flow detected. Um, she's still alive, although now she's getting complications from other parts of her primary hypert uh, hypertension. So the lesson here is I think we can help patients for those people that cannot undergo surgery, but do remember these are not easy procedures to do. You may need repeated procedures. For the safety and efficacy of ablation of benign and uh, nodules and recurrent thyroid carcinomas, look here. Overall and major complication rates are significantly higher for malignant thyroid nodules. And this is something you need to know when you transit from the benign nodules to treat the uh, malignant nodules. And why? And certainly because post-operations, you know, there's altered anatomy to the neck. You know, lesions can get very close to the nerves, really along in between the carotid and the jugular. It happens all the time. We need to ablate beyond the size of the tumor to get good uh, clearance. Now, the, no, this is not usual. The unusual complications I encounter sometimes, a very persistent cough. Maybe I hit the vagus, maybe I hit a superior laryngeal nerve. And there's one patient whereby I was a bit overly aggressive because she got a couple of nodules. She got laryngeal edema after that. Now, she didn't get a, a, a recurrent laryngeal dysfunction. She got a laryngeal edema, uh, which one of my close friends, ENT, uh, diagnosed for me and said we should watch. So this is something that you really also need to uh, find if you want to start to do malignant work get an ENT who understands voice. Not all of them do, and certainly those that refer to you for ablations may not treat vocal cord disease. If you want to start doing malignant disease, it's time to make friends because they can really help you out when things go wrong. So finally, what happens when they invade the thyroid cartilage? Uh, Professor Beck et al. Uh, classified into acute angle, right acute angle, acute angle, and of course, when there's tracheal ablation. And certainly, as you start getting the difficulty from the left to the right, you're going to get more complications as well as less successful ablation. So this is one, one of my own case for obtuse angle. First thing I did was to hydrodissect the tumor away from the trachea. You will be surprised. You think that you can't do it, but... Uh, quite often, you can do it quite well. I also then hydrodice it away from the carotid, and then I start the blading. If you're more adventurous, Professor Beck described stenting the trachea first so that the invaded nodule becomes everted out into the neck, and that's when you can carry on ablation. And then, as you can see here, great result. Although I must warn everyone that there are reports of uh, tracheal necrosis post-ablation in this arena. In conclusion, um, treatment of PTMC by ablation is controversial. Treatment of PTMC on its own is still controversial. Ablation is certainly effective, but is it oncologically appropriate? And this is something that we need to uh, tell us ourselves. Five years survival outcomes look similar to surgery, but are they too short? And how does this compare versus active surveillance? When we are treating differentiated thyroid carcinoma, we remember that we are doing it with palliative intent. For patients that can undergo surgery, we, we cannot promise cure. Non-surgical candidates, however, we should have no problems offering them. Do note that you're getting higher complication rates when you're doing benign lesions. You may need repeated treatments, so warn everybody. So beware of follicular lesions. The dust is not settled on that. For recurrent disease, what I'd like is when they have gone for RAI and neck dissection and still get nodules, and we'll go and cherry pick them. There's no data on long-term survival. And certainly for me, I have 
send patients post, I have done patients after RAI and thyroid dissection and ablation back to thyroid, uh, back to neck dissection before. And because, you know, the, the systemic therapy and the TKIs are not really very uh, effective yet, we continue going. And again, not much data is out there, so we do uh, carry on with patient. That being said, I'd like to make the first announcement of the radiology conference in Singapore, SGCRYS, our both diagnostic and interventional radiology conference in August 2020. I'm part of the organizing committee, and here I'm arrest my partners. Um, the theme this year is augmented radiology. Now, I'm sure, you know, this, uh, this sentence by one of the fathers of AI gave us all the wrong feelings. And this was actually five years ago. And we are still training radiology. So we are not being you know, destroyed or rather we want technology to augment us. And the theme this year wants to explore that. We have lots of theme, uh, breast, AI, IR are the main themes across, across the others. We invite you to save the date and to follow us on uh, uh, internet as well as Facebook. In addition, our Emergency Radiology Society is having a conference webinar in January 2020, uh, 14 to 15 of January, with uh, lots of interesting topics that will uh, be entertaining, I'm sure, uh, over two days. So we also ask you to register now. And with that, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Tu, for encouraging us to do the ablation into the malignancy case in also tell us the fact of the treatment as well. So I'm sure they're gonna have the, so many questions to you after the lecture. And also to give us for the for announcement of the interesting seminar. So let's move on to the last topic of today. So the first speaker of today, he's the endocrinologist, Dr. Xu Hang Chu. So he is the chief of the Endocrine and Diabetes Center in the Chinese Western Medicine in Nanjing University. So his topic today is about the microwave ablation versus radiofrequency ablation for the benign non-functioning thyroid nod too. So please welcome Dr. Xu. Thank you so much. It's a great honor for me to be invited to uh, join this uh, webinar meeting. And uh, I'm very glad to share a very interesting study which was conducted in our single center. We compared the effect and safety of microwave ablation versus radiofrequency ablation for benign non-functioning silent nodules. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk, uh, I'm going to introduce my topic in five parts. First thing, let's go through the background and I think everybody So my ablation now is uh, First line chop treatment for benign thyroid nodules, which is not a very good candidate for surgery. And the microwave population is mainly used in, China, in mainland China. However, there's little study to uh, some uh, a few studies to compare the efficacy between microwave ablation and radio frequency ablation in the treatment of benign thyroid nodules. While radio frequency ablation is mainly used in Korea, and then it was introduced to the European. Um, American, and now there's a lot of evidence to show that radio frequency ablation has a favorable efficacy in the treatment of open thyroid nodules. Therefore, in the last year, the European Thyroid Association and recommend uh, 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 that the uh, laser ablation and the radio frequency ablation as the first line when the patient choose some ablation treatment for their open thyroid nodules. However, let's go through the, uh, the, the principles of radio frequency ablation and thermal ablation. And there's some technical differences among, uh, between radio frequency, uh, radio frequency ablation and thermal ablation. And briefly, that microwave ablation has the potential to produce, to produce uh, faster and larger ablation volumes with less susceptibility to the heat think the effect. So there are some studies to compare the radio frequency appellation and laser appellation because of the technical uh, uh, advantages, just like uh, moving shooting and the radio, the, the radio frequency appellation may achieve a larger uh, volume reduction rate when it compares 
weight is compared to late, to late population, and there's some meta analysis and some randomized control studies has has uh, have um, proved that the effect of late population ablation is better than less ablation in the volume reduction rate. What about radio frequency uh, ablation and microbe ablation? There are two studies from China has tried has tried to uh, to illustrate the effect the differences between radio frequency ablation and microbe ablation. This study from China was conducted in uh, many centers. This is a, a prospective multiple center study. And finally, um, um, a total number of 1,252 patients was treated with radiofrequency ablation, uh, I mean, microvaporation. And when the, com when the efficacy and the safety was compared, the radiofrequency has a slightly um, better effect in the, uh, in the volume reduction rate when it compared to microwave ablation. And no significant, uh, significant differences between uh, the microwave ablation and, and uh, radio frequency ablation when, uh, when uh, this is uh, from another study. And this is uh, a total of 943 patients received microwave ablation or radio frequency ablation. And after one to one propensity score matching, 289 pairs of patients was matched. And this study didn't show any differences between the microwave ablation and radio frequency ablation. Therefore, we conducted a randomized control study to, to compare the efficacy and the safety of radio frequency ablation and microwave ablation for the treatment of benign non-functional saranodules. Therefore, I'm going to share some details of our studies. First, let's go through the materials and, 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 and the methods. This is the inquiring criteria. Um, briefly, the knowledge should be confirmed by fine needle, biopsy, fine needle aspiration or coronary biopsy to, benign, to be benign. And the patient should have some complaints of uh, compression or some cosmetic problem. This is the this is exclusion criteria. And we collect the basic information from the patient and we also perform ultrasound imaging studies regularly and we calculate the volume and the volume reduction rate. And also we, re we record the complex. Technical and effective rate um, to calculate the effect, the true effect of two methods. Here is the results. Uh, this is a flow chart of patients enrollment procedure. Finally, 36 patients was, was enrolled and, four, uh, and 18 patients was allocated to microvibration and another 18 patients was allocated to radio frequency ablation and we followed six months after the treatment. And this is the baseline characteristics and you can see there's no differences among uh, this, no uh, differences um, between these two groups when they was enrolled in the study. And this is the um, volume uh, change. In radio frequency ablation group may have uh, I may have a smaller thyroid volume of uh, ablation. And this is the volume reduction rate. From here, you may find at the third month follow up, the radio frequency ablation has a higher volume reduction rate. However, when, uh, when the patient was followed at six months, there's, a, there's no difference was found. What about the effective rate from uh, statistically, there's no differences between these two groups in the, uh, in the effective rate. However, you may find the radio frequency ablation group have a higher effective um, rate. 
difference. And this is the typical, uh, there, there are two, uh, there are some pictures from uh, two patients and this, these typically, uh, these typical images uh, show a significant volume reduction during the follow-up. What about some secondary outcomes of two groups, just like cosmetic scores or, or complications? There are no differences um, between the complications. However, the radiofrequency ablation has a lower cosmetic scores. It may indicate radiofrequency ablation has a higher uh, efficacy in the uh, treatment or to, to solve the cosmetic problem. What about the thyroid function? And as we all know, these two effects doesn't, ch doesn't change thyroid function after ablation. And this is also proved by our study. Most effective and safe methods in the treating benign thyroid nodules. Larger volume reduction rate can be achieved in the rate of filling principle ablation group than that in the micro ablation group at the three months. Rate of frequency ablation group had a lower cosmetic score than that in the micro ablation group. So let's let's talk of uh, let's discuss why there are some slightly differences among these two groups. It may be because of the technical differences. In the micro ablation, the higher central temperature in tissue usually more than 150 degree, which was commonly produced by microevaporation. Therefore, the carbonization is, may occur easily, even at a relative low power output. Therefore, the, uh, this, this may cause some differences in these two Lower microevaporation power output of 20 to 35 uh, might be uh, um, might contribute to minimize the, the, the carbonation in the ablated nodules and increase the uh, volume reduction rate of microevaporation group at follow up. Um, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Xu, for an interesting article and showing us the, the comparison of the IFA and the microwave population in the thyroid not group. So now we at the end of the all lectures. So I think now we can start with the Q&A session to our speaker. So I think they have a few questions in the chat box. So Dr. Xu, um, so I think you mentioned about the complication that we are very afraid in, want to prevent. And so it's about the, the dextrose water, a cold dextrose water when we found the hotness or the suspected the laryngeal nerve injury. So how, how cold of the dextrose water or how, how we prepare the, the cold water for this situation? So you, usually if you, you really encounter nerve damage during the thermal operation, we recommend use zero degree Celsius. It means ice, ice 5% glucose water to inject just uh, peripheral uh, in the nerve location. So for example, if we, we treat benign audio, usually we will cause some thermal damage to recur angel nerve. So we can inject the 5% glucose water, ice, I called called call five percent goose water in the thyroid bed. Or if you cannot inject into the thyroid bed, sometimes you can inject to the thyroid nodule direct di directly to uh, decrease the temperature of the nodule because sometimes the heart will uh, affect the adjacent recurrent angel nerve and cross the thermal injury. So if you you just prepare for a call. You can put the five percent glucose water, five percent glucose water in the refrigerator. Once you need, you just use them. I think it's okay. So that's mean every time when we, before the procedure, we have to prepare the ice, the the cold lactose like water as well. Okay. Not not every time. I think if we prepare once, we really need. We don't. We don't have to be worried about, we don't have this kind of mm, material. Just put the 5% gross water in the refrigerator once we really need. 
just use that. So, so what about the other speakers? The, have you have the experience for this? Uh, yes, and my, my only comment is that you need to inject the cold water for a very long time. Um, the, the function takes about 15 to 20 minutes to come back. So you just keep injecting and you keep talking to the patient and pray their voice comes back. So this is, it's, it's, it's very frightening the first time, I can assure you. <laughs> um, but if, if you catch it early, uh, the chances of them coming back is quite good. Um, the other thing that we don't recognize is especially patients with big goiters, when they're lying down, everything is pressing on the trachea. So there's one patient that got a bit of uh, voice hoarseness, but he was big. He, he was very big. So after a while, we got him back to about 90% of his original function. But the minute we set him up, once you know the weight gets lifted off the trachea, he was normal. So this is something to think about as well. But you just keep injecting until the voice comes back. <laughs> okay. I think, it's, I think it's not easy because as other do recommend, it, you usually have to inject quite a long time because the paper has mentioned usually during the injection, the patient will have their voice recover. But for my very limited experience, it really takes time. Even we inject the cold water, we just follow the paper which they told us, but <laughs> it really takes time. Maybe 30 minutes later, it really takes time. You really, really very scary experience for for us, I think if you really- And as a, as a test of your patience as well. Yeah, so you, you better have a fellow injecting in the room or else you're just holding the needle. Oh, 30 minutes. Should have some assistance, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so are there any differences, uh, I mean, between this still water and the normal saline? Some doctors uh, recommend maybe this, this still the water may- Maybe so you, you don't really want, I mean, you can give distilled water, although distilled water is quite caustic to tissue. If you're not, you want to give some things uh, physiological. Um, if you, uh, I mean, if you intend to continue doing ablation, you should be using D5, uh, RFA. But microwave is okay. You, you can, uh, your microwave will boil whatever water. So if you want to, if you still want to continue ablation after the patient lost their voice, you should use D5. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hmm. So, so, so when, when you stop inject the cold water, so I mean, if the pace, the, the, the wire is not recovered, so do you have a time that, oh, this is uh, too long to, to inject <laughs> cold water anymore, then you give up? Just, I, usually the patient will recover, totally recover, but it takes time. Okay. If we inject, if we inject cold waters in some situation, the patient really can recover maybe several minutes or 30 minutes, even one hour later. But if we don't inject, it takes time for, initially I did not have this kind of concept. So my very scary experience was my, my patient recovered. Her voice about four months later, okay. four months later. It's, the patient will recover because we just caused thermal injury. We, we did not reset. Just for surgery, because sometimes it's in very rare situation, the surgeon will reset the nerve. It's impossible for the patient to recover, to recover their voice. But even we, we just use the thermal, we just cause thermal injury to the nerve. It's we are totally recovered, but it really takes time, maybe several months. Mm -hmm. I, I do send them to the ENT. The, the injection is quite a, it's an office procedure to inject uh, into the vocal cords and, and they get so much better. So I, I also think that we, we should not hold back from sending them to the ENT surgeon for injection. Uh, one of my classmates is doing voice, so she's my favorite person when I do thyroid ablation. Uh, yeah. But we, we should send, we should send, we should send. Okay, I think Dr. Ching, yeah, I think Dr. Ching also showed the ultrasound of the vocal cords. I think that's quite neat as well. Uh, you can see it quite well. You surprisingly, you can see it quite well. You would think that it's the air structure, um, but you, like like doctor, sometimes you just if they're moving or you can see at the end of thirty minutes nothing is moving. Uh, you know you're in trouble. Okay, so in, they have the question: Is there uh, the maximum amount of the water that we can inject? Hmm. Maximum amount because I I don't have much experience, but. I, one time I discussed the question with my teacher, Professor Peck. Professor Peck just always 
told me, keep injecting, keep injecting until the patient recover their voice. But I, I don't have any idea about how, how much cold water we can inject for the patient because some ENT doctor have so much worry about because they think if we inject too much water will cause some compressive, compressive effect or mass effect for the patient. But if we inject to the potential space, it's okay because this is kind of potential space. The fluid will uh, go goes to different press, maybe inside media stand or to other press. But I, I have no idea how <laughs> how much. Commonly, uh, commonly twenty to seventy milli uh, a liter thermal saline was uh, used when I perform microvibration. I think patients is, is, is okay with the, um, this volume of Because, okay. because I, uh, I, I do some re literature because for doctor using microwave, they usually perform hydrodissection even for the benign audio because high, uh, microwave is very powerful. So they usually uh, we, in, we use hydrodissection. So I, I remember some literature has mentioned even they inject more than one more than 100, 100 milliliter is also mm -hmm. okay. But I think it's a little bit scary for us. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so I think this is a very important question. So for about the diagnosis before the treatment by the ablation. So I think, so we need a tissue diagnosis, but what is your practice? So we do the FNA or we do the core biopsy for the benign or the for malignant, maybe they have a different situation. So can you share this to us? So um, certainly if I, so if a patient comes to me with a follicular neoplasm that still wants to do a vision, I take a call biopsy. Um, but do, uh, do keep in mind that your pathologist may be very irritated with you because they are not used to reading call biopsies of the thyroid. Um, for malignancy, I just do an FNA because I just, yes, in proven malignancy that recurred, I just do an FNA. I just want to show this a recurrent PTC and, and move on. I, I agree with Dr. Tao because for the benign audio, I think the most important is to make sure the ultrasound appearance of the target nodule that do not show any suspicious sign. Because for the benign symptomatic nodule, usually it's very big. Even we perform many times, funny dog aspiration or coronary dog biopsy, we cannot 100% guarantee the nodule are really benign. But the most important is the nodule should not have any malignant suspicious sign. But for the uh, Benign uh, for the metastasic lymph node or recurrent lymph node, we just perform funny dog aspiration to make sure they really they are really malignant nodule. And also for follicular neoplasm, if the patient really want to receive operation, I usually perform coronary dog biopsy because as Dr. Do has mentioned, it's very difficult for a pathologist to use funny dog aspiration to make the diagnosis of follicular neoplasm. But I think finding door, corner door is also okay. Yeah. Okay. I think so, the major concern for okay. the patients with papillary micro, uh, uh, papillary thyroid microcarcinoma is the uh, preoperative uh, diagnosis because some of them may have uh, indeterminate cytology, but with a positive testing of BRAF mutation. So these patients commonly clinically was regarded as papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. However, these patients want have a pathologic report and medical insurance. So sometimes I perform more but only like 40, 40 to 50. I have a diagnosis diagnosis with coronary. I think this is very difficult for for a document diagnosis for papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. Okay, so what about the Dr. Giovanni? So any comment for the, the biopsy or the FNA before the treatment? Um, I think Dr. Giovanni went into an operation. I'm not sure okay. if he's here. Okay, okay, that's fine. So thank you. Dr. Xu, you're breaking off. 
Your sound is breaking off. I think there's a connection problem. Yeah, the, the, the signal is not so well. Yeah, it's a bit unstable. Mm, yeah. Okay, so let, let's move on to the... So I think this is maybe the one of the challenging questions. So they ask the, what is the biggest size of the nodule that we can ablate it? So do you have the size limitation for that? Maybe the, both three of you? Um, I've, I've done eight centimeter before. Wow. Yeah, so you can see the, you can see the nodule from the patient's back. Uh, but now he's almost flat. And I, and I broke two needles doing him because I was trying to bend and everything. So I was ablating, ablating, and suddenly it's like, hey, how come there's water coming out? <laughs> and smash my face, like, oh, I've broken the needle, and that is the cooling. Uh, um, but but uh, to, uh, yeah, uh, but you can do quite large lesions. You can do retrosternal lesions as well. So after ablation, then the retrosternal part comes out, and you blade them again. So, so how, how many sessions do you have to do for, for the uh, eight? Two. Uh, oh, the, the boy? Oh, the, the, no, the, the large one once, amazing. I finished him in one session. Oh my yeah, God. he tolerated all, all eight right. centimeter. I, 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 I could. <laughs> it's quite good. <laughs> the maximum diameter I was down was uh, I, I have uh, the the, the um, uh, appellation is eleven. Eleven, uh, okay. Eleven centimeter. It's quite large. That's big. And I think the major concern for our uh, the clinicians to perform the ablation some ablation is in some uh, uh, older. All the patients, you have to, you have to uh, worry about their breath function because even a small nodule with some some ablation, the patients may have a decreased oxygen saturation. It occurs in the in the surgery. You have to be prepared well before you perform the, the ablation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I think this is a uh, one of the. Important question is about the anesthesia. So I, I believe most of the procedure performed by under the local anesthesia. So, and do you have any the technique to do the adequate anesthesia? Or any of you have to use the light sedation combining, or you just do only the local only? I, I usually, I think for be nice, I know in audio, local anesthesia is totally enough for a patient, but for some very big, but, but I think it's okay. But if we want to perform a procedure for quite a long time, usually the patient will complain because they have to keep lying down for quite a long time. It depends on the patient, but for my personal experience, no anesthesia is totally no problem for thyroid IFA or microwave. Yes, okay. At least 30 minutes. I think the patient may be okay with uh, one injection of lidocaine for, for local anesthesia. So no need uh, any painkiller during the procedure, the fentanyl or? I think it's not necessary. Not okay. necessary. For benign audio, usually the patient can tolerate the procedure. Unless we really perform the procedure for quite a long time, or sometimes in some very huge nodule, but I will discuss uh, with the patient, maybe we can use separate section, but it means the patient will pay extra money for the procedure. Okay, that's a good point. So I think this question is come from the surgeon. So he asked about the, how good of the experience in the underside that need for the surgeon before perform the ablation. So maybe Dr. Shu can give us the, the comment. Um, would you like to repeat your question? <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so how good how good of the experience in the ultrasound before starting the thyroid ablation? Oh, uh, this is very important uh, that you have, you should have enough experience with 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 the ultrasound. For me, as an endocrinologist and the internal uh, physician, I think it, it's it's really hard for me to initiate to just to, to 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 start this technical treatment. Uh, before mm -hmm. I start microvibration or radio financialization, I have done uh, like uh, 2,000 final aspiration 
I think that this should uh, to press more with finite aspiration, and then maybe you have you, you can easily learn how to perform microvibration or radio flux translation. Okay, so can can you tell us the number again that you have experienced before? I mean, before starting the procedure. Yes, uh, before I start some ablation, I have done like two thousand cases with fine needle aspiration. Uh, it's very oh, easier okay. for for a, a, a physician, you know. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 a lot. Two thousand, <laughs> right? So, but but that that's a very good thing to start. Start with the F and A first. So and give give us the information about the, the ultrasound finding. The one yeah. of the very important is not only the FNA, but we have to combine the knowledge of the ultrasound finding suspicious characteristic of the nodule with the FNA result and perform before performing the ablation, I think. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> So, so may I ask a question about the tumor rupture that you show us? So, so what, what is a risk factor that can easily happen? The tumor rupture complication. So do you have any comment for this? And I, I think it's because tumor rupture, uh, nodule rupture is not very common. It's really rare because for me, I think I only have four, four patients, four patients too. I only have four, cases of tumor rupture. So actually, I, I don't know the risk factor for tumor rupture. In some situation, the patient during the, for some patient, during the whole procedure, they complain, the pain, they feel pain, they feel swelling, they feel all kinds of discomfort during the whole procedure. But after that, they did not have no tumor rupture. But for my four patient, in my, in my memory, they did not complain any discomfort during the whole procedure, but after one month, they just, I just encountered the nodule rupture. So it's very difficult for us to predict in what situation the patient will, uh, will have this kind of complication. But the most important thing is once we really encounter nodule rupture, how do we manage, manage this situation? And in some situation, if the nodule was is was too big. Sometimes maybe we need some surgical intervention. Even we have to recommend the patient receive surgical resection. But fortunately for me, for my all four patients, they just receive conservative treatment. I give them some medication, antibiotics, and they keep draining. Sometimes you can see the, the small wound, so the pus can drain out by themselves. So just we just educate our patient to just change the wound keep clean, don't make the wound infection, it's okay for them. So it's really not common, but if you do quite in a quite, if the case number is was quite big, one day we really encounter this situation. But I think we don't have to worry, just keep observation, uh, prescribe some medicine for them first uh, and after that just, yeah. Request our patient to take care of their wound. Yeah. So do do we need to do the aspiration in case of this? So yeah, I saw you you show like a pus coming out. Yeah, yeah. So it's very it's, re, it's very out. interesting. Each usually the patient for the first, uh, I think for the whole process, initially the patient will complain swelling, but the, at that time the skin still intact. But after that, our strain muscle, initially the strain muscle will go outside because of the accumulated fluid, so injury. So initially the, the neck will become swelling, much more swelling than before. After that, because the strain muscle will come back to the normal size, so the fluid will go through the strain muscle. And after that, you can see something, you can see past like wound, and they just keep drainage out. Maybe my patient, my patient told me maybe for, they have to change their wound for maybe one week. So we don't have to aspirate because sometimes it's very sticky, very, very sticky. It's very difficult for us to aspirate all of the internal fluid, just keep them freely drench out of the wound. But the most important thing, we have to educate our patient, not cause infection. 
to the internal fluid because if once it get infected, it's really very big problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let, let me ask Dr. Chu, you, you mentioned about the investigation before performing ablation in the malignancy case. So, but for the lymph node, it's very difficult to, to tell this is a malignant or the normal lymph node. So you think the follow-up is enough or you think the preoperative investigation should be added, the CT or MRI or the PET scan? So oh, I, I think for PTC, um, the REI is helpful. The radio iodine uh, scans yeah. are full, uh, the, um, but um, as the patient gets, okay, so what you'll find is that you know, do RAI every once a year, and then after it's helpful, but in between, I just do ultrasound. It, it is just uh, too much radiation, uh, actually. Mm, okay. So, so I have a question, if, if, if you don't yes. mind so much. Okay. So, I mean, I don't do microwave, um, but technically, what is the difference between RFA and microwave when you're actually doing it? Now, we know that when we do RFA, right, we, we hear the pop, and sometimes when the resistance goes up, it cuts off. And, and to me, that's a safety feature, uh, which microwave doesn't have. And especially when I'm doing uh, parathyroid adenomas with the 3mm needle, I, I like that safety feature, so I don't burn the nerve. So uh, for those who have experience in microwave, maybe we can uh, hear some. So when I transit from RFA to microwave, what should I be looking out for? Um, uh, microwave actually is now uh, mainly used in China and because it, it, it can be covered easily by medical insurance. So, so many patients would like to uh, receive microwave ablation currently in my province. Um, Briefly, microwave can produce a faster and a larger ablation, and sometimes it may cause uh, easily damage to some important structures around thyroid capsule. So uh, the hydrodissection, uh, enough hydrodissection is really essential before you start the ablation. And in my personal experience, and uh, two patients with, my, with hyper parathyroidism and uh, micro thyroid, papillary thyroid microcarcinoma uh, occurred, um, the, um, a, 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 a mild damage to, uh, how to say, laryngeal nerve, a uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. And one was, uh, one recovered uh, four months after ablation and another one is still during the recovery and the pain is still complaint of, um, uh, a voice, voice change of, of closeness. So I think for pay for, for our clinicians, radio frequency may be show a slightly um, higher efficacy and safety in the treatment of um, even it is not statically different, uh, statically uh, statistically different in their in our randomized control study. This is a main randomized control study, and we randomized uh, these patients was randomized randomized into two groups. Even the, the, the samples is, is still very, very small. And uh, another difference is, is uh, another difference is the, um, the, the, the needle of radio frequency ability is much, how to say, um, sharp. Yes. Mm. yes. <laughs> it, can, it can easily be mm. insected in, into the thyroid nodule. So, I think it means between these two technicals. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, so I think what, one of your question is about the heart nodule. So I, I'm not sure, is that mean the calcified nodule? The, maybe the big calcified nodule, can we do ablation or not? Have you done for that? Calcified nodule? Because for if for the cash fine audio, sometimes if we perform final aspiration for the cash fine audio, it's I don't know. <laughs> but for me, it's almost impossible to penetrate to use the needle penetrate the 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 cash fine audio. Even I use really very strong. <laughs> I I cannot penetrate the cash fine audio, so I I I don't have any experience to treat cash fine audio by using 
I's way or other method. I think it's still kinds of limitation. Maybe, maybe it's kind of limitation for the thermal operation. And it can be dissolved by, by, by thyroid. I mean, the micro, uh, the, 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 uh, the calcified area cannot be uh, ablated and be dissolved by, uh, okay. by, by thyroid yeah. tissue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. <laughs> what what about the microwave? You think can can they lyse the the cal calcium? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> the microwave is more like a micro oven, you know. It can heat faster and quickly. <laughs> but the mechanism is should be the same, right? Yeah. So Dr. Tu, you mentioned about the margin when we performed in the malignant nodule. So, so, so how, how margin that we need? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. You get one mm, you're happy. You get two <laughs> mm, you reach for the moon. It, no, it's, it's, it's truly difficult. And, and I struggle. I struggle when I do PTCs more than one centimeter. I try not to do them, but you know they somehow get sent <laughs> when they don't want surgery. Um, it can be very tricky. Uh, be careful. Um, my only advice is, you know, don't be afraid to stop and come back. I think using CEUS, as some of the uh, other speakers have said, uh, uh, it, it's quite interesting. It's just that uh, right after ablation, when there's a lot of gas locked you, sometimes I'm not too sure whether I can trust the CEUS, but an interval CEUS and coming back may not be a bad thing. Yeah. You mentioned about the informed consent. That's very important, right? So they have a chance yes. of coming back to us. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so you, you have to tell the patient that, you know, you need repeated procedures um, and of course the risk of future cancer. And I was mm. having a side check with uh, Dr. Lin and on the chat is that I, I do predict that in the coming years, we will start starting getting reports on cancers that we miss on ablation. Now, whether if that translates to overall survival, we don't know. Uh, we might never know simply because, you know, thyroid patients live forever. Certainly, I have come across a, a surg surgical paper comparing patients eligible for ablation, but went for surgery instead, they pick up like uh, uh, no 15% of cancers. And, and, and I, I do predict that going forward, um, this will be a, a part of the problem that we will face. Okay, thank you. So have you treat, so have you treat assess that category four nodules? Yes, I have. Um, when patient truly decline, um, and, but they must look quite benign on ultrasound. So if they look echogenic, they look smooth, I have less of a problem. Now, Dr. Lin, again, has a paper on PET uh, for follicular neoplasms. Um, uh, personally, I'm not too sure, simply because it's very high dose. Um, but certainly um, from, from his series, that if you have a low SUV on PET, um, he, uh, maybe, I think he's co-host now. Maybe we can ask Dr. Lin to have a few words. Yes, yeah. hi. Uh, show. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. yeah, good night, everyone. Hi. Yeah, it's so nice yeah. to have you here. Um, we, we were hoping you could, uh, if you could tell us uh, a little about your paper that Dr. Tu just, just mentioned. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate uh, this opportunity. Uh, let me online uh, to answer this uh, critical uh, question about uh, the your problem. Uh, actually, uh, just an uh, appearance of uh, Dr. Tu. Uh, a lot of patients, Initially, they would not like to treat their goiter, but once uh, again, uh, one doctor had to uh, do fine needle aspiration and it become a tipia or follicular neoplasm. The patient become uh, nervous. So they come to us uh, for the uh, thyroid operation. But uh, even that uh, we do uh, the core biopsy uh, through the capsule, we still cannot prove it 100% uh, that is a benign nodule. So uh, we found a, a series of paper published here using a, a PET and a retrospective to find that uh, if the SUV number is low enough, uh, such as uh, lesser than four, uh, the benign uh, uh, molecular negative predict rate can achieve a very high, uh, su such as 95 to 98%. So only 2% of them, uh, if they go for a surgical resection, it will turn out to be a malignancy. So uh, we will uh, explain to our patient if they accept the uh, risk of the two to 5% of malignancy from the 
uh, for the hernia present, and then we will do the operation for them. Yeah, that's my uh, experience. So now uh, for a patient with uh, for the hernia present, uh, we will explain to them that go for the PET study and we check if we can help them. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. That is very good data to explain to our patient first. Okay. So I, I have a one last question. So any of you doing the ablation in the functioning nodule? And so if we have that, so do we have to control the, the thyroid function first or what is the pre-medication before doing this kind of case? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hello. Yes, I treat to some some patients with uh, functioning nodules. Yes, but most of them are very small, like two, 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 three centimeters. It, it cannot be Oh, Dr. Xu, so I, we cannot hear you. Connection is pretty okay. Hard. I mean, I have treated, I have treated several patients with functioning nodules, and these nodules are, are in the, the the maximum diameter it was in the range of two to three centimeters. I would not recommend a large nodule like maximum diameter was was over four centimeter. It's not good candidate for some evaluation, I think. So, do do we need to control the thyroid function? Before treatment, this kind of case. Um, uh, sure, sure. And uh, we also treated some patients with grave disease because of the goiter. The patients was complained of the cosmetic problem, even, particularly in young female. And I found that thyroid stimulating uh, receptor, uh, thyroid hormone receptor antibodies yeah, uh, was elevated after ablation. Uh, some uh, one of one female patient was found to have uh, Graves apoptosis after microevaporation. So I think it's it's more like a, a, a radio radio iodine therapy for grave disease. So I also treat to some patients with uh, rituximab, you know, which is uh, a monoantibody to treat grave apoptosis, and we found that the TRAB level was significantly uh, reduced after the combination of uh, some ablation and a rituximab. So I think uh, we should control thyroid function before we start. And I think for this, not just their anti thyroid drugs, uh, we should uh, evaluate their thyroid function two weeks after ablation and decide. Uh, whether to, to discontinue the antithyroid drugs. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So I think we, we come to the, the very end of the session. So thank you for the all attendees and all speakers to giving us the, not only the lecture and also the, the answer, the very interesting question and also the case discussion as well. So before, before we end off the webinar, so any last word from all the speakers? So maybe some last word for all of you. Maybe start with the Dr. Shu first. Um, uh, I thank you for your invitation and I'm glad to share some of my points and I hope to meet you guys more frequently. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, what about, yeah. Dr. Shen or Dr. Chu? Okay, um, I, I think um, before you start, maybe attend a course. Um, it is, the procedure itself is not, is not wildly difficult, but it, I think it pays to, to have a look. And I think um, most of us have, I mean, some of, uh, most of us here have been to Professor Bag and just watch him uh, do a couple. So I, I think that is great advice, actually. Because is that available in the SGCR wires next year? Um, if you ask, I'll make one for you, Samra. <laughs> okay. Dr. Shen, is there yeah, any yeah. last word to all of us? 
Yeah, I think it's some operation for the Sinoid audio is currently very popular in the world. So I think we have to learn this technique, no matter how IFA or microwave both of these different tech, uh, modality can really help the patient, but we still have to overcome some learning curve. After that, we, still, we, we really can give our patient very good treatment without, because the patient just received local anesthesia, and the, the treatment result was really, well, the treatment results are really very good. And it just, I think the whole procedure is much comfortable than surgery. Yeah, it's just my personal uh, personal opinion. Thank you. And uh, thank you for Echo Company for giving, me, for giving me this opportunity to share my very preliminary experience. And also I can see my good friends online. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, thank you everyone, and also the very importantly, thank you for the echo for organizing the the good and wonderful webinar. So hope we can follow the the webinar from this company and see you next time. So have a good night. Thank have a good you. night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It uh, has been an excellent session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. See you Good next night. time. Bye. Yeah, see, see you. Next time. Bank, see you. See you next time. See you. Uh, if we still have audience, uh, if you want participation certificate, you know what to do, and uh, make sure you're subscribed to Echo Microwave LinkedIn account to get future information about webinar. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your time. Uh, we will uh, keep you updated about next webinar. Thank you, bye.